Well, great. Thanks for here, and thanks for the introduction. I should tell you how Texas was, was a myth is tall, dark, handsome Texan. Born and, bred, born and bred in Texas, and the choice was either he came to Idaho, not happening, <laughs> or I came to Texas, and so moved to Texas. And that's actually when he was running the, the American Land Foundation here in Texas. Uh, he had, he, he, um, had lobbied the Farm Bureau and the Farm Credit Banking System, and they started this, found, this foundation, the American Land Foundation. So when, we, when I got here and we got married, um, we put the two together, and that's how we created America's Sons of Liberty. But between the two of us, we've been working on property rights issues for over 30 years. And I come at it, um, sometimes I say not by choice, because I was raised in the, the ranch in Nevada, and uh, learned a lot about uh, all, all the troubles that come when the federal government is a part of your business. And if anybody is familiar with the Western lands, they'll know what I mean. Our state, so to give you, to give you an idea, we had an average size, size ranch in Nevada. It covered 1,100 square miles. So an average ride for us is about 25 miles a day. We literally grew up on the back of the horse, chasing cows. And, um, but what's important to understand about the West, our state that I grew up in, Nevada, is 87% federally owned. 50% of the West is owned by the government. Completely different than Texas, which is private. 96% of Texas is private. What I'm going to talk about today is the environmentalist way of making Texas like the Western states and worse, the 30 by 30 program. And really because of that, that early experience, and I mean, I, I could go through a lot of stories, which I'm not gonna bore you with today, of the difficulties when the federal government is your business partner, and how they can really increase the restrictions. In a nutshell, while we didn't own all land that we raised, we had the grazing right, and we did own all the water. So to wrap up what they did, the federal government, the Forest Service, filed over every one of our water rights and then used all the regulatory tools they have to drive us out of business. And they can do it. They've got the power to do it. <coughs> so that's one of the reasons we are so passionate about this issue, the 30 by 30 issue. But also to give you a little more background, do you guys remember the Trans-Texas Corridor when it was coming through? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, that is the first, um, in, as, as Shelley was um, giving some of our background, we used a strategy that we really developed when we first developed it in West Point coordination, which requires the federal agencies to come to the table and coordinate uh, local plans with the federal plans. And it's a tool, it's the only tool that we really have to get accountability from the federal agencies at the local level. So we've had great success in the West in using it on, on issues to stop particular actions. When the Trans-Texas Corridor was uh, being pushed here in Texas, Dan found in our state statute, and we have statute 391.00, uh, or 9, or 9, okay. And it's in the, the local government code, and it says that all state agencies shall coordinate the sub-regional planning conditions to the greatest extent feasible. Now we knew what coordination meant under the law because that's what we used in, in the, the West. And um, so we used that statute to create the first sub-regional planning commission in Texas. We did this in I think around 2007, 2005, maybe 2005. Uh, Eastern Central Texas sub-regional planning commission, five little towns in Eastern Bell County. And then once that was formed, we sent the first letter to Textile and said, you're required to coordinate under the statute. So Tech Thought came to Holden, Texas and had the first coordination meeting on the Trans-Texas Corridor. We worked with them for 27 months. We brought Tech Thought to the table three times. We made a great case for how the Trans-Texas Corridor, corridor did not comply with the environmental <coughs> impact statement. We brought in EPA, we brought in TCEQ, we brought in all of these agencies. And um, ultimately, you remember when they, when TechStop came out and had this big press conference saying, hey, we've listened to the public and we're not going to build the Trans-Texas Corridor. 
Well, it really was going on. You can read it in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Center Zachary, the design builder behind that whole project, uh, said that they were stopping the program because they could not get environmental clearance, meaning everything that we had advanced on how they were not complying with the environmental impact statement gave the Federal Highway Administration the cause to issue a no-build decision for Mass Texas Corridor. They were shut down. And it was done by, strategically, um, these five little town mayors who stood up to it and let us work with them and implement these strategies. So I give you that background just mainly so you have an idea. We work um, at the local level in cases like that all across the nation. We're in two right now going on, one in New Mexico and one in Grand Staircase, which is equally, equally as impactful. Um, but we do this all over. We also work with, um, at the state level and at the national level. And see if I can make my slides here. Okay. So just the background on us. Uh, we function, we educate, uh, we organize, and we act. So we do, uh, at the times came and interviewed us, they'll be coming out with a piece on 30 by 30, what we're going to talk about here. Uh, I've been told it's coming out in January, so we'll see when it comes out. We hold national summits where we bring property rights advocates and leaders all across the nation together, and uh, we held our last ones last year in, uh, on Earth Day in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> and we also host the Property Rights Task Force, which has property rights leaders across the nation, <coughs> groups like the Heritage Foundation, the Heartland Institute, uh, CFACT, and then we have county commissioners across uh, the country also involved. So the purpose of that task force is to connect the grassroots with DC. Um, and we activate. That's kind of what I was telling you about with the Trans Justice Court, we do that grassroots work. And so these are our publications, just so you can get familiar with us. Standing Ground, we do for our members, it's pretty depth. Liberty Matters is our online news service, it's free. This is something that I really hope all of you guys will sign up for. We come out bi weekly. But this is basically the system we use to keep you guys updated on property rights issues across the nation. And it's also when things happen like 30 by 30, is how we act. And then we do briefings, like this uh, briefing that you have in front of you. A lot of our educational programs are designed to digest all of this information, and put it in a format that's very easy for you guys to, to understand and to communicate to others and to spread to others. All right, let's jump in. So what is 30 by 30? 30 by 30 is an international agenda to permanently protect 30% of the world's land, of the world's Lands and oceans, and now in the waters. It's an international agenda. It's being pushed on every nation, and some nations are quite a bit further ahead of it than, than we are here, and we'll talk about some of the implications of that and what's going on later in the program. This agenda um, is something that America obviously has re resisted. Once Biden was elected, they knew they had their guy and they knew they could implement this in America, and so they have. The first piece that we really, as when Biden was elected, we started really taking a look at what the environmentalists were talking about. What they were discussing with you was going to be the Biden agenda. And that's where we saw 30 by 30 coming up over and over again. So we really drilled down to learn what is this program. <coughs> the first piece that we really took a look at uh, that explains a lot, and if you really want to understand the environmental perspective behind 30 by 30, this is a great piece to read. It is the Center for American Progress, which is a progressive left organization started by uh, John Podesto, funded by Bloomberg, Soros, all of them. Okay? Their purpose, the, the purpose for this organization is to implement socialist policies in America. You can read their website. They're not bashful about it. This piece, How Much Nature Should America Keep, is the, the paper they did to basically tell the environmental groups and anybody in America who wanted to implement this agenda, how do you do this in America? Because in America, there's a particular problem to get this agenda adopted. It is the people own the land. OK? 
Okay, other nations, the government's in charge. There may be property rights, but they don't have the protections that we do. Uh, they're either run by royalty, elites, or government. So it's very easy to get these kind of agendas into place. And in America, they have a big problem. In America, still today, thankfully, the private individuals, private property is 60% of the nation. 40% of the nation is owned by government, which is pretty scary. But 60% is still in the hands of the people. And let me take a moment and just tell you why that is so important. You know, when we think about our nation, we are a nation that is known for self-rule, where we have individual liberty. We are run by the people. That's how we were set up. And our founders did many things that were very wise that allow us to still have those freedoms today. Simple ones that you all know. Separation of powers. That was brilliant. Uh, the Bill of Rights, absolutely necessary. But, but when it comes to it, those are just words on paper. What, what, what do we actually have that allows us to defend those rights? They did one other thing. They made sure that the people owned the land. Do you all realize we are the first nation where it was the people, the citizens, that went out and settled the land, and everybody could stake their claim of America. When the Louisiana Purchase was made by Thomas Jefferson, he didn't call up Bill Gates and say, how much do you want? He didn't call up China. He didn't do any of those things. It was open to settlement. And depending on the state where the citizen was going to lay their claim, you could, you could take up anywhere from 120 acres to 640. That everybody was allowed to go get their piece of the land. Why was that important? Why did our founders believe in that? Because they knew that if each individual had the ability to grow their own food, build their own home, protect it, mix their hands, their, their work with the soil, with the labor of the, of the earth, and create productive <coughs> products, industries, <coughs> and support not only their family, but the local community, and in the states, and in the national government. So he was always supposed to be in the hands of the people. Well, that changed during the robber baron era when they were trying to retain a monopoly over uh, not only you know, other industries, uh, if you're familiar with that history, but also the resources coming out of the West. And they influenced Congress, which actually, if you read the history, is probably illegal, in fact, I think it was, um, to allow the president to withdraw certain lands in the West, the West was being settled and retained in federal ownership, which is primarily to eliminate competition. That's why 50% of the West is federal. So that's kind of a brief American history, which I kind of got a little sideline, but it's important for you guys to understand. Land, our ability to own land is absolutely essential to us having now, the Center for American Progress knows this. You all know how Karl Marx defined socialism? The abolishment of private property. That's how it's defined. Anybody who is trying to implement socialist ideas knows the people cannot own property in order to get socialism in. That's why they're coming for our land. <clears throat> okay, so this group, let's, let me drill down a little bit into this and just tell you why do they have this perspective? So here's some of the things they claim in this particular document. A million species are going to go extinct in the coming decades if we don't permanently protect 30% of our lands and oceans. What's this based on? Climate crisis science. What is climate crisis science? It's based on models. Projections. It's not real science. Any real scientist knows you don't use models to tell you what you should be studying. What questions do you need to be asking? But if you're a true scientist, you don't rely on the outcome. They do. That's what this is all built on. And they say in America, a third of the species will go out of sea if we don't do this. They say we're losing a football field worth of habitat every 30 seconds in America. That's too frightening. That sounds pretty ominous. That two thirds of the development that is occurring in America is happening on private lands. In Texas, we need to pay attention to that. 
This is not about the federal lands. 3530 is equally about the private lands. We're cutting for our private lands. And only 12% of the lands in America currently today are permanently protected at the level of the C for the additional 18%. All right, so let's break this down. Well, first let me tell you how this got implemented. The first key document that we saw that was filed was actually in the Trump administration. It was a resolution in the House and the Senate which advanced this concept of 30 by 30, not supported by Trump, but I'm just telling you that's how far back they can compare into this. And if, so it's just a resolution in the House. It's not even an act of Congress. But, and there were only 15 people across the two, two bodies that actually supported this and signed on to it. So really, we shouldn't be too concerned, right? Except you signed it. Mm -hmm. Senator Harris then, and Representative Holland, who at the time that we found this, her name was being floated to be the Secretary of Interior, which she is today. Why is that important? Because the Secretary of Interior oversees most of the land in America that's owned by the federal government, and a lot of the programs that regulate private property, like the Endangered Species Act. So we had true believers at the top of the government for this program. So yes, we were concerned. <laughs> All right, how did we get started? January 27th, 2021, six days after President Biden was inaugurated, he signed Executive Order 14008, 57 pages, two paragraphs to go to 30 by 30, most people missed it. And this is what it said, to achieve the goal of conserving at least 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. Well, if you didn't know what 30 by 30 was, you would you wouldn't even really think too much about this, correct? Okay, so we saw this, we read it on the day it came out, and even we needed confirmation. We knew what it was, but we needed confirmation. Were they really going to try to implement this to the, the degree that the Center for American Progress had been advocating? That was our big question. So the same day, the Department of Interior issues a fact sheet on what they will be doing to implement 30 by 30. And in it, they say, we're losing the football field where they have to have every 30 seconds in America. One third of all species are going to go extinct. And only 12% of the land is currently protected. So we knew this was cut and paste out of the cabinet board. We knew that they absolutely were going to be trying to implement the most extreme viewpoint of 30 by 30. All right, let's break it down. Let's, let's run through some numbers. The 12%, what is currently protected according to them in America? The 12% is made up of our national parks, wilderness areas, Permanent conservation easements on private lands. Now, if you're a landowner, you put a conservation easement on your property and you think you still own that land, the government believes different. And we can talk about that later if you have any questions about it, and we can help explain that. My husband as well. All right, so CAP also defines what is the definition for conserved lands, for lands that are going to qualify as this program. According to the currently accepted international and domestic standards, for an area of land or ocean to be counted as protected, it must be permanently protected in a natural condition, and extractive uses must be limited or prohibited. That's what they're aiming for. This is what it looks like. This is the USGS gap analysis. The two dark areas on the map make up the 12%. The light green area is, is our other federally owned lands, um, which uh, are, are kind of are regulated, but not to the extreme level of, of close to non-use. And then the white lands are primarily private. Now National Geographic has been promoting this worldwide. So the piece they did in 2019 on America, how America should do this, they created this map, and they showed to scale what it looks like. So you can see the outline of the U.S. The small box is what the 12% looks like if you put it all together. The big box is what 30% looks like, what they're trying to achieve. So America, we're about, to, in round numbers, 30% would be about 700 million acres. So about 300 million acres they already have protected the way that they want. Governor Ricketts in Nebraska, former Governor Ricketts in Nebraska, says it's the best. It's the equivalent protecting one state in Nebraska every nine years, or one state in Nebraska for the next nine years, or two states in Texas. It's a heck of a lot now. Now this is the one that I really love. You always have to check their numbers. Remember, 
We're losing a football field with a cap pattern in 30 seconds in America. We're all supposed to be very concerned. So what does that come down to? It's 3,000 acres a day, 1.1 million acres a year, 11 million acres in 10 years. That's the problem as they define it. If you believe their numbers, that's the problem. Of course, this doesn't take into account all the land that gets put back into natural areas, which happens all the time. So the question becomes, why are they seeking to add an additional 400 million acres permanently protected in nine short years? If the problem, as they define it, is 11 million acres. This is not about conservation. You're going to be told this is about conservation. This is not about conservation. It's about control. This private land a target. I just want to re-emphasize this for us Texans because we have had major agriculture groups in the very beginning of this come out and tell their members this won't impact Texas. And it absolutely will and it is. The United States will not reach a 30 by 30 goal unless policymakers do more to help farmers, ranchers, fishermen, and other private landowners conserve lands, waters, and wildlife. They cannot do this without the private landowner. They cannot do this without, without agriculture. And agriculture would stand up and say no, they could not implement this. But unfortunately, we have too many groups in agriculture that like the money that comes through the conservation programs, and they're not willing to take this on the way they should be. Is 30% the end? No, no, this is just the beginning. The CAP report says, in fact, if the United States achieves 30 by 30, the country will be well positioned to pursue the longer term goal of conserving half of all of its lands and waters. Where does this come from? Conservation biologist named E.O. Wilson came up with this idea that half the earth must be permanently protected in order to save humanity. And these guys are true believers in this. And it's happening. At the state level, we're already seeing this concept creep into uh, state politics. State of New Mexico, the governor signs an executive order supporting and implementing 30 by 30, our neighbor. But our executive order goes even further to conserve at least 30% and an additional 20% for climate stabilization areas. She's at 50%. Let's go to Vermont. This shouldn't surprise you. Bernie Sanders state. The House and the Senate passed a bill which moves the state to get towards 50% by 2050. Thankfully, there's a Republican governor who was recently elected in time and he vetoed the bill. So who's running the program? That's another key question to ask. Is this really going to be implemented? Do we really need to worry about this? We've already talked about some of the top people, but you know, they're policymakers and you kind of wonder if they're all there all the time anyway, so you, know, you kind of have to discount a little bit. Um, but who is in the White House who knows how to functionally get this done? That's what we need to look at. The author of this report, his name is Matt Lee Ashley. He is chief of staff to Brendan Mallory, who is chairman of the Council of Environmental Quality, which is a cabinet position, and she co-chairs the task force on 30 by 30. So the architect at CAP is in, is in one of the top positions to make sure this is implemented. And remember who the founder of CAP is? John Podesto? Well, after the Inflation Reduction Act was uh, passed last August, Oh. President Biden put him in charge of the National Climate Task Force to oversee and make sure the distribution of all the money they received uh, is properly allocated to implement the climate crisis agenda, including 30 by 30. All right. So 30 by 30 was initiated January 21st of 2021. As I told you, we knew it was coming, so we were ready. Mm -hmm. We reached out, the first county we reached out to was Garfield County, Colorado, and they got to work quickly. Uh, we hired an attorney in Arizona that we worked very closely with, developed a resolution to oppose 30 by 30. 
and Garfield County passed it three weeks later. And at the same time, this first, this, um, the pamphlet on 30 by 30 that we're handing out, I think this is version 7, but the first version of that, we uploaded. And we sent it out to our network along with the model resolution and asked people, you need, told people, you need to know what this is and pass the local government resolution in your community. And it spread like wildfire. When I said it's really important that you guys sign up for Liberty Matters, that's because that's the network we use to do things like this. And as a result, within three months' time, we had probably 50 local governments, 50 counties across the nation opposing Liberty Matters. That was key. Uh, Lauren Gilbert from Colorado went back and spread what was going on on 30 by 30 through the halls of Congress and it spread like wildfire. We had over 70 representatives uh, come out and oppose 30 by 30 within a couple months. And Governor Pete Ricketts in Nebraska, we sat down with him. He uh, came out and opposed it, and he's been a very, very strong advocate for our position. Nebraska is 96% private, 97% private, agriculture state. And he opposed it. When we sat down with him, we asked him if he would circulate a letter to the other governors to also oppose it. And he got 22 other governors to sign a letter with him, sent to President Biden, all within a three months span. So we're now up to 150 local governments that have opposed the directly. That All of those things were absolutely key. Because if you remember at that time, a lot of crazy stuff was going through the House and the Senate. And we were concerned we were going to end up facing a 30 by 30 bill because 30 by 30 is not authorized. There's no congressional act that authorizes it, no constitutional uh, basis for 30 by 30. That's why it was done by executive order. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, that never happened. Uh, it became branded as a land grab, and the Biden administration was trying to defend that in the press. So what did they do? When they came out with their first report, they pivoted and concealed what they were doing. Uh, this report was supposed to tell us what land are they targeting, what does conservation mean, how is all this going to be put in place. That's what it was supposed to tell us. Instead, what they did was they explained that they're changing the name. It's no longer 30 by 30. Now they want to call it American Removal, something the American people can really get behind. All of this is meant to, it's a ruse, it's propaganda, that people who don't know what this agenda is really about to get in behind it and support it. And there's a lot of little carrots in here, and there's great things in here, it's expanding, expanding city parks. Um, a lot of things that all of us in the room would say, hey, those are great ideas. And then there's all the bad stuff. And that's what we have to, to look out for. But it, this report is designed to get the unaware public involved in supporting it. The other thing that they did was they said, you know, um, conservation can mean, a thing, can mean a lot. It can mean different things to a lot of different people. So we're just not going to define it. So they say in here emphatically, this is not about protecting the land. This is about conserving the land. We're just not going to define it. We need to conserve. It's such a ruse. And then, I mean, how can you expect this from the Biden administration? This shouldn't be any surprise to this audience. So it was a pivot and conceal. All right. So how's it being implemented? <coughs> what they're doing is they're doing it administratively. There's a lot of environmental laws on the books. A lot of laws that control the use of land, control species. Uh, those are all being used as tools to get to the 30% goal. They're making federal land acquisitions. They are Congress fully funded and permanently funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund, half of which, so the fund is funded every year $900 million, half of which is to be spent on federal land acquisitions. Why do they need to be buying more land? Encourage enrollment in conservation programs. This is key. Uh, many people in agriculture use conservation programs, conservation reserve program, EQIP. There's a number of programs that are out there where federal funds help, help do things like um, soil conservation projects, set aside of acres for habitat, uh, water improvements, a lot of things that actually, I mean, your agriculture 
group, your ag people in agriculture believe are very good things that are good for the operation and good for the land. But these now are being hijacked, I think is the best way to say it. Um, first off, they're pouring a ton of money into these. Second, in the Inflation Reduction Act, the new money they put into these programs that changed the language. And instead now of supporting soil and water conservation programs and those kind of things, the priority for the funding is to control livestock emissions and mitigate the climate crisis. So they've changed the language. So what's happening is you have landowners out there who have been signing up and using these programs since 1985. When they first signed up, they researched it and made sure it was okay to get into and it wasn't going to encumber their property. And so they continue to go in and sign, in, sign up thinking it's the same program and the language is changing. Now that language that went in the Inflation Reduction Act is something that we have, we have a briefing paper on if you're interested because we've been trying to get members of Congress and the Senate to understand what happened and make sure in the Farm Bill that's coming up next year, the same language is not utilized. They go back to the original. So that's something, if you have any connections there, that's something to make them aware of. The other thing is they are putting a ton of money into giving a ton of money to land trusts, non-government organizations that go out, knock on landowners' doors, and say, hey, you want to put a conservation easement on your land in perpetuity? We're the best guys to do it. And it's, it's so great. It's a really great thing for you to do. They're funding it. So groups like the Nature Conservancy. So what they did is they gave a billion dollars to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which is also funded by Jeff Bezos Earth Fund, that should tell you a lot. And then they grant to land trusts like the Nature Conservancy and other all kinds of land trusts across the country for them to go in and push landowners sometimes into conservation easements. And they usually prey on other stories like the widow who just you know, lost her husband, now has a whole place to run on her own, uh, and really doesn't know how to do it, and they come knocking on your door about that time and saying, hey, we've got a solution for you. Why is this important? Because when you put a conservation easement on your land, you change the conservation purpose. Now becomes the priority that manages that land. You as a landowner, your purposes are secondary. They can be written in the contract that's protected, but ultimately it's the conservation purpose that is always going to prevail. That's why we tell people, if you put a conservation easement on your land, you certainly have the right to do it. Just understand that once you do it, it's no longer private property because you have just signed away control of your land. And control is a vital element of private property. Who controls it? So what's this look like in the West? Environmentalists have just really released their campaign and how they see getting this done in the West where they already own so much land. This is called the We Wild of the American West. It came out, uh, coordinated right with the Inflation Reduction Act, and that was passed. It was printed first in bioscience to give it a scientific uh, cover. And then Outside Magazine printed it immediately, as well as the World Economic Forum, which tells you this is the international push. The concept is, to create 11 districts, they're all different colored up here, on the federal lands, to create two corridors. These districts would be connected where they don't own the property, they would make federal land acquisitions or conservation easements in perpetuity, and create wild, wildlife corridors is the other key tool they use. And they'll put all of these together to create two, basically two corridors from Canada to Mexico. And this is for the wolf, so the wolf can run freely from one end of America to the other, and the beaver. Now why? The wolf takes the land, the beaver takes the water. In Wyoming last summer, they made the largest federal land acquisition they've ever made in the state of Wyoming. A state that's already 50% federal. 35,000 acre acquisition, and it was done without the governor's knowledge or the county commissioner's knowledge. This is what could be happening in Texas right now, we wouldn't even know it. One thing that the Biden administration did early on, within days of initiating 3530, was the Department of Interior uh, withdrew a rule which required 
Secretary of Interior to mm -hmm. notify the county commissioners anytime they're trying to acquire property in their county. They got rid of that rule so that they don't have to let you know anymore. All right, I'm going to take it out and let's, let's move into the international realm. I told you early on that, that, the European, or that, that this has been pushed on nations worldwide. And many nations are way ahead of us. And in the European Union, they adopted the uh, version of 30 by 30 for them called Natura 2000, right around 2000. This whole area is the area that they mapped who needs to be protected at certain levels. Okay? So when they first came in, they said the same things. In fact, you can go to the European, the Natura 2000 website and read right today how this program is just. It's there to help working landowners do better with their land, do more for the land, to help conserve, restore, and protect. Same verbiage that's in 30 by 30. But what's happened? So they've been at it for a while. The conservation programs are in. Uh, the encumbrances, the federal nexus, well, for us, the federal nexus is tied to our private land. All of that's in over there. So what they've determined is that there is a species of moss and clover and some other vegetation that uh, they just, they've decided, the term, Nature 2000 has decided it needs to be protected. So they are requiring farmers and ranchers in the Netherlands, who many of them are generational, they have, their families have owned that land over there longer than ours have here. Um, and they're being told, you're going to have to uh, stop your operations because too much nitrogen is going into the soil, which is animal feces. And at the end of last year, November 22, the Dutch government's Nature and Nitrogen Minister issued a about a 12 page rule. And in it is requiring the voluntary sale of two to 3,000 farms and ranches in the Netherlands to reduce the nitrogen oxide. And this is what I pulled from her report. She says, if this does not work, in other words, how many countries do you know where you have to voluntarily, you're required to voluntarily give up your land? If this does not work, then we must, with pain in our hearts, <coughs> enter into a discussion with a targeted group in which mandatory instruments will be used if necessary. The deadline she's given is August. You either voluntarily do this or we're going to do it for you. And what they really need to do here is the, under Nature 2000, they only have so many nitrogen credits. Well, they're using them all up with agriculture. And they want to put in solar in here. And they don't have any credits to do that, because that also emits nitrogen. So they need to reduce the landowners who are giving off the nitrogen in order to have the credits to give them to solar and wind. This is a transfer of the land. And most recently, December of 2022, the United Nations made it official. This 30 by 30 concept is now an official agreement that many, many nation, nations have signed on to. And um, fortunately, the United States did not sign on to, not because the Biden administration didn't want to, but because the precursor to this, which was put before the Senate, our Senate, the Biodiversity Treaty in 1992, and was on the floor ready for a vote, Thankfully, some of our colleagues, who still work with today, had uncovered the map, the Wildlands map is what it's known as, that showed all the areas they wanted to lock up in America. It was hidden at that point. They got it exposed, and uh, Senator Kay David uh, Hutchinson of Texas is the one who brought it to the Senate floor, showed her colleagues why they could not ratify that treaty. And so they never ratified it. Which meant, because of that, Biden couldn't sign this one today. So the work 30 years ago, don't ever discount what you guys do and what you guys fight for. The work they did 30 years ago saved us today. What does this do? Because more than 30 by 30 like we've been talking about, it advances as the religion, the only religion they discuss in this document is the worship of Mother Earth. Environmentalists, the real radicals, their beliefs, they worship the creator, not the creation. This is a religion that's as old as history. 
and it is now really making its way back. Mother Earth, you can read this document, it's mentioned many times through this document about protecting Mother Earth. Along with that, nature shall have equal rights with humans. <clears throat> of course, all of this requires urgent, transformative action. Society must change. And they are calling on $200 billion to implement this. There's a lot of private companies that want to look sustainable are footing the bill for, and other nations. And I'll tell you what is probably the most criminal part of all of this, is they're taking that money, and they're really trying to advance this agenda in the third world countries that aren't in a position to defend themselves. And many of those governments are just happy to have the cash. So they're giving up their land to this agenda pretty easily. And that is something America is in front of. So one of the passages in the Bible that I think really speaks well to this, to our moment where we are right now, is one out of Ezekiel. And God is issuing this oracle on Jerusalem. And he says, And I sought for a man among them who should build at the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. To me, that's one of the saddest passages in the Bible. And we cannot let that happen to a man. They are after our land, which means they are after our liberty. We have to write this. Have to write this. So what are some things you can do to help do that? Um, one of the key things I'm going to ask you all to do, whatever conservation groups, recreational groups, even environmental groups that you support, if you do. There are a lot of groups out there that we think we're supporting something really good. Um, and we find out that maybe they're not into things that are also good. Go home, whoever you contribute to, look them up and see what their position is on their road. One big website to go to is Hunt Fish, 30 by 30, if you do recreation or hunting at all. This sheet, has the address on it. And I, if you pick one of these up uh, and take it with you, you can go home and look that up. I'll give you one right now that may surprise you that supports 30 by 30 National Rival Association. And when that came out, so they endorsed this Hemp Fish 30 by 30, which is a list of a ton of recreational and hunting organizations that support 30 by 30. You can read their statement. When they first came out with it, and I have gone back and read it later, they may have changed it. But no mention of protecting private property rights at all. It was all about as long as we can have access to the land, of course, we would support this very noble idea. And that's what they have signed on to. Now, when National Rifle um, Association came out with their statement, uh, of course, we got a hold of it. We put it out again to our network, the Liberty Matters Network, and what they had done. And they got so many calls from members saying, what are you doing? And saying, I have, I have canceled my membership. I'm out of that. So they took that statement down. And we've had members you know, call and, and ask them what's your position on it. Oh, that was never our position. It was absolutely their position. That's what you guys can do, is answer those kind of calls. Um, so they took their statement down, and they're still signed on to Hunt and Fish, 30 by 30 to go to their website. Educate your local elected officials. This is really key. We have over 150 local governments now signed on to with a, an official uh, resolution opposing their government. I will tell you why that's important. The Biden administration is selling this agenda, saying it is locally driven. See, this international agenda is something you guys came up with that you guys really want. That's what he's selling. And so when we can show them, no, no, <laughs> people do not want this. That not only uh, helps uh, us argue against that, that position, but it also helps your senators and representatives to argue against you in Congress. And then again, sign up for Liberty Matters. This is how we can keep you updated on what's going on on this issue and how we need your help. If we need you to make a phone call to a senator or a representative, you can do that. Uh, I will tell you, what are the good people 
in Texas that's been very good at helping fight this is Chipotle. He's been very good on this. Chipotle. And the information overload is now over. <laughs> But I just want to impress on you guys. And first off, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this. And, um, you know, whatever you can do to help us to fight this, please do. We're fighting it at all levels, local, state, national. We have a great group of Americans across the country fighting this. And we need to make sure that, that passage in Ezekiel does not happen to our nation. We need to be legions. Legions standing up against this kind of action. So anything you can do to help us, we greatly appreciate it. God bless you all.